Welcome to our event on APEC 101. What can we expect in November in San Francisco? This is the very first time San Francisco will be host city for the APEC leaders meeting. And today you're gonna to hear about the history of the meeting, why it's important, what's on the agenda, and how we locals can participate. The big gathering is in mid-November. We'll have leaders from 21 member economies in town, China, Russia, Taiwan, and the US among the group. And here to break it down for us, we are very pleased to have Monica Hardy Whaley and Kurt Tong as our special guest speakers. They are both in town for this uh, event with us. And we have Japan Society's Larry Greenwood moderating. Our Asia Society Honorary Chair Jack Wadsworth will give opening remarks. And a warm welcome to our honorary chairs, Jack and Ken Wilcox, right here in the front row. We have many board members and advisory council members, too. We also welcome representatives from the consulates with us. We have representatives from the Philippines, Korea, the UK, Indonesia, Singapore, and the Hong Kong Economic Trade Office, and Japan, Jimmy-san. From the city of San Francisco, we have our friend Mark Chandler, and we have from the office of Protocol Marone Foster, a big warm welcome. Thank you to our event partner, Japan Society, for collaborating on our program today. We really appreciate all of you being here to support our mission of navigating a shared future. I'm Margaret Conley, the Executive Director of the Northern California Center. We have an hour for this program. We'll finish at 6.30 p.m. Today's format, I'm very shortly going to introduce Jack, who will give some remarks, and I will also introduce Larry Greenwood. He's gonna introduce our two speakers, Monica and Kurt. They'll have a moderated discussion, and we will have time for audience Q&A. If you have a question, raise your hand. If Larry calls on you, a microphone will be brought to you. Please introduce yourself, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. This event is on the record. We are recording, and it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel. A few words now about our honorary chair, Jack Wadsworth, and then Larry Greenwood. Jack is an Asia Society Global Trustee Emeritus. He's honorary chair of Morgan Stanley Asia. He was based in Japan and Hong Kong running Morgan Stanley. He has been instrumental to the growth of our Asia Society Northern California Center for the 25 years since we've been established. And following that, Larry will speak, and he's on the, the board chair of Japan Society Northern California. He's senior advisor to the Bauer Group Asia. He's a longtime diplomat who has been posted at embassies in Japan, the Philippines, and Singapore. And now we're going to hear more from both of them about their experiences with APEC. So please join me in welcoming Jack Wadsworth. Margaret, thank you uh, so much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here today, and I am looking so forward to getting up to date on APEC. Um, Monica and I have known each other for, we think, about 30 years. We met in Malaysia when APEC was in its early days, and we just got started on war stories about those days. Um, those were interesting times. Uh, about the Asia Society, I want to say this is the sweet spot for us, programs like this that bring all of the thought leaders and important issues together in one place uh, for a discussion is what the Asia Society is all about. We have 15 centers around the world. We are cooperating uh, in many ways. And uh, the Asia Society Policy Institute, obviously, is the um, is the centerpiece of those discussions, and uh, uh, we've had them many times in San Francisco, and uh, post-COVID, it's just a global exercise almost every time we get together. On APEC, I just want to say uh, two things. One, uh, I was involved with PBEC, and uh, for those of you who know anything about APEC, there's a business group that really underpins um, the country organization. And I think it's fair to say that PBEC was really what founded APEC, and it was a group of like-minded businessmen that felt uh, it would be important to get business views into the minds of government leaders. 
And uh, that is exactly what they did. And one of the things that um, I was always surprised about, and still am, was that PBEC itself had the opportunity to be the business funnel into APEC. And uh, the leadership at that time was afraid that they might be influenced by government, uh, hence ABAC, if those are the right uh, uh, letters. Uh, so there's kind of a separate organization that uh, uh, is a helpful source of um, business information to the leaders at APEC. Um, one historical footnote, when I went to uh, Tokyo and began making trips to Taipei, uh, one of our advisors was a man named C.F. Ku, and C.F. Ku was an absolutely extraordinary individual who I think was really the bedrock of APEC and PBEC, and uh, I so admired him, one day I asked him, uh, if as a member of the Japanese diet, which he was, um, uh, if he spoke Japanese. And um, he said, my mother told me that I should not speak Japanese if I were going to be in the diet because I would be suspicious. And that gave me um, great encouragement because I was never going to learn enough Japanese to be <laughs> <laughs> effective in business. But C.F. Ku was really the bedrock, an extraordinary person, and uh, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that the entire APEC uh, complex may have a lot to do uh, with his leadership at the time. So with that little historical footnote and my respect for APEC and all that it stands for, over to you, Larry. Thank you very much, Jack. And, uh Let's give Jack a round of applause there. That's great. And thank, thank you for your, your leadership in, uh, in Asia Society over so many years. Uh, thanks to the Asia Society and Margaret. Uh, when I took this idea to, to Margaret a few, a couple of months ago, because we knew uh, we had brought Kurt to town under Japan Society auspices, uh, I thought it would be a great opportunity since both of us had done APEC that we could do something. And we had no idea we'd be able to get Monica here in person, so we're so pleased. This is, this is great. Let me just say a, a couple of words about, the about APEC overall and then turn it over to the people who know what they're talking about. Um, two days after APEC was launched, the Berlin, the Berlin Wall fell. And I mention that kind of that connection because uh, APEC was very much set up in that historical context. APEC was set up with, under the principle that, open, that, that countries that are open to trade, to investment, to ideas, will succeed, will, will prosper, and that that trade, that free flow of trade, um, will underpin peace and prosperity. And that was obviously the, that was the ethos of that period. Soviet Union had collapsed, or was collapsing, it didn't officially get dissolved for two years, but it was collapsing at that point. And that was really, and, and APEC was the very first global post-Cold War institution that was set up in the world. Um, and it was, uh, it was set up with that, with that ideal. Um, it was also very different from the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, you know, the World Bank and the UN, um, in, the, in the sense that it was uh, very decentralized, uh, a very small secretariat with very little, little power and almost no resources. <laughs> we, we deliberately starved them of resources. Uh, because we didn't want to have big fights uh, in, you know, it, over, over money and bureaucratic fights in, in the center. We wanted it to be a decentralized organization. Um, and it was, as Jack has pointed out, it was very open. In fact, I would say the most, uh, in terms of multilateral institutions, the most open to private sector input and participation. And uh, again, this distinguished APEC from a lot of other organizations uh, that, that existed at that time. Um, and its it basic job is to really bring together uh, government officials and business at all levels, you know, from working level to C-suite to, to, uh, to C CEOs on the business side, from, from working level and, uh, and deputy assistant secretaries like Kurt, Kurt and myself, to, uh, to leaders on the government side at all levels and virtually every sector of economic activity. It's hard to think of anything that APEC doesn't cover when it comes to the economy. Right. And, uh, Monica has to keep it all straight. That's what's amazing. That, uh, but anyway, um, so let me just paint very briefly the structure of APEC. So a APEC operates on three tracks. 
government, private sector, and academia. Uh, so the, the government is the uh, so-called senior officials, and you'll hear us talk a lot about SAMs. The senior officials are the, the ones that govern uh, the, uh, the uh, activities of APEC. And they oversee the work of about, I would say, 40 working groups, uh, probably more. And under the 40 working groups, there's even more work streams. And so um, literally hundreds, probably, of work streams in APEC. And that's all overseen by the senior officials. That's what, that's what Kurt and I were in the day. Um, and uh, that group gets together f four times a year. Uh, and uh, it basically plan out the activities of, of that year. Those working groups, uh, the most important of which is this, the Committee on Trade and Investment, uh, which is, um, it's obviously, as the name suggests, it works on liberalizing and facilitating trade in goods, services, and now, importantly, digital trade. Uh, but there's the working groups in, again, almost every area, health, energy, uh, environment, uh, chemicals, automotive. Uh, I, I won't go through all 40 of them, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's very broad. Um, then you have the, um, the, the private sector side, and I'll let Abe, um, Monica talk more about that. Um, but uh, that was created in 1996, and Jack mentioned it, the, the APEC Business Advisory Council, ABAC, was created, actually initiative of the U.S. government. Madeleine Albright was the one who proposed it. I, I had the, the misfortune or fortune of actually writing the proposal. It was dictated to me by Sandy Kristoff, who was uh, the uh, important, another war story. We can talk about Sandy war stories all night. Um, but uh, but uh, that was proposed by the um, by the United States government. It was then went through 1996. Was the ABAC was created to provide a formal mechanism for input into the APEC, APEC uh, government process. And and Monica will talk a lot more about uh, how that works. Uh, and then there is and then there is a second part of the uh, the uh, business input, which is actually in the financial sector, one that Jack knows well, which is the Asia Pacific Financial Forum, and that was created in 2013 to provide input from the financial sector into the finance minister's process. And I, to back up, I should have mentioned that there's one other aspect of the government side, which is the finance ministerial process, which is, uh, which is obviously manned by finance ministries around, around Asia. A very similar kind of process uh, feeds up to the ministers. Um, so all that process, both of those feed up into a ministerial meetings. There's about six to 10 of those a year, depending on the host country. The host country floats, I think most of you know that. Every year the, the host country floats around. It's not any particular order, you just raise your hand and, and usually get picked right away. And this, this year was a little bit more difficult. And, and, uh, and, um, and, the, uh, uh, and then th those ministers meet and then they, they basically push up initiatives to the leaders level and the leaders meet once a year. And that's the other uh, thing that's different about um, APEC versus the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, none of those actually have annual leaders meetings. They, they don't have presidents and prime ministers getting together once a year. Now we have G20 and those kinds of things that but all that came after APEC was created. Uh, so this really was the first big multilateral organization to actually have these, these leaders meetings. And that, as we'll talk about, make, makes a big difference. The third track is academia. I won't talk a lot about that. I don't know if Vinny is here, but uh, there's an APEC Study Center Consortium, uh, and these are a uh, universities that have set up APEC Study, study Centers. Um, and there's seven of them in, in the United States. Uh, there's many are all around uh, Asia. Australia has a whole bunch of them. And, um, and they are what, what you think. They do research, uh, research in this area of uh, basically supporting economic integration in the Asia-Pacific region, and also, of course, creating networks for academics who are interested in that area to get together. And they have an annual conference uh, that was put on by the study center uh, that's based th th in the host country. The APEC um, chair, uh, I'm sorry, the chair of the U.S. APEC study center uh, a center network, which is now the chair of the whole consortium because we're the host, is uh, Vinny Agawa. I don't, I don't, I don't think Vinny is here, but he is from Berkeley, so he's. Um, it's you have part of that right here in the Bay Area. So that's that's the structure, um, and uh, let's then talk a bit more about the, you know, what, what it means on the ground, how it actually works, and also more, most importantly, we'll get to it. Uh, what does it mean for San Francisco to have leaders meeting here in November? Let me start by asking Kurt. Um, so Kurt was the senior official who basically managed the 2011 uh, um, APEC year, which is the last time the US hosted APEC. 
and this leaders meeting was in Honolulu. Uh, so I wanted to ask um, Kurt um, how you see uh, the evolution of APEC, uh, from the, from, particularly from the government point of view, uh, but, and what's, what's different between 2011 and 2023, and, and what should be San Francisco be prepared for? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce Kurt, or Monica. Sorry. <laughs> I, I have to do that first. So, Kurt Tong, a career, career foreign service officer, uh, uh, retired now, 30 years in the service, almost all of it in Asia, was our senior official, as I just mentioned, for APEC from 20, thir which, which years were you? Uh, 28, 9 to the thir nine, 10, 11. Nine, 10, 11. Uh, and uh, is now a, the, the managing, par a managing partner at the Asia Group, which is a consulting and a business advisory group based in Washington, D.C. Uh, so, and I'll, ask, I'll introduce Monica when we come to her. So, Kurt. Okay, great. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and it's an uh, enormous pleasure, and thank you again to the Asia Society um, for, for organizing this. I think it's very quite timely for people in San Francisco to um, uh, bone up on, on what uh, APEC is and, and how it might feel to be uh, the host city for, for the, the uh, event of the season in, uh, in Indo-Pacific uh, economic affairs, certainly, and, and I think this year, um, political affairs as well. The, a couple things that I'll just add on to, to Larry's description of, of APEC. Um, one is, the, is in comparative perspective to some other organizations, uh, it is similar to the G7 and the G20 in the sense that the chair and the host uh, rotates. Um, it is similar to the OECD in that it does have a capacity to do technical work. So it's kind of a little bit of a G20 with a regional rationale to it as opposed to the G20 being the 20 largest economies, the G7 being the snotty rich economies that want to exclude everybody else, um, and the APEC being the important economies on both sides of, of the Pacific. Um, but it has elements of that uh, more technical, wonky, OECD-like uh, ability to dig into the details of specific issues, which sets it apart. The role of the chair, in this case the United States, is to decide the agenda, choose the, the locations, uh, the tempo of meetings, but most importantly to propose and then coerce all of the members into agreeing to a, a set of, of outcomes for the, for the year. Um, and that's it's a fun job. Uh, a, a gentleman named Matt Murray is the senior official this year. Uh, he gets a lot of support from the rest of the U.S. government in, in doing so. Uh, but it, it's a it's a annual annually reconstituted um, circus of negotiations uh, and initiatives, all trying to get attention and accomplish the changing of minds uh, around the region on some issue or or set set of issues. Um, often people ask, so why? APEC and what is what is it accomplished? Why why, in, in a historical perspective, is it a useful thing? Because people often focus on the fact that it is not a one of the things APEC is not is a binding organization. Is not the WTO. When uh, an announcement is made by APEC leaders or a group of ministers or a working group, uh, it does not have the force of law. And if and if any of the economies, and they're called economies, not countries, because of the standing, interesting, uh, unique standing of a couple members, uh, the, uh, namely Taiwan and, and Hong Kong, um, which are not members of the United Nations, last I checked, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, they're not binding results, but they can be very meaningful nonetheless because the, the, the economies have made political commitments to those outcomes. Um, the, uh, so it's a gradual annual year-by-year -year process of moving the consensus, if there is a consensus, from 
one place to another place to another place for all the economies in the region. And that's a, that's a, a significant endeavor and, and meaningful in shaping how the region works, particularly in economic terms. There's another rationale to it, which is the fact that there is a leaders meeting. As Bill, there was not initially one, but Bill Clinton decided in, in I believe it was 93, uh, to, to uh, invite leaders and it's been happening ever since. In that case, it was in Seattle at Blake Island. He also made a drastic error in giving everyone a bomber jacket, <laughs> uh, which then resulted in, in this uh, rather ridiculous tradition of, of giving the leaders funny outfits, which is, for most of the people of the planet, that's all they think APEC is. It's like these leaders get together, they spend tens of millions of dollars flying around the world, and then they put on outfits that make them look ridiculous. Um, and uh, that's all true. <laughs> um, but there is actually, they, do, they have to do some other stuff in addition to putting on their funny shirts. But having leaders get together in that grouping is a reinforcement of the concept that the, the nations and economies of the, of the Pacific share a destiny and share a mission Mission number one, don't have any wars. Mission number two, come up with rules that uh, enable everyone to prosper. APEC has also, over the years, resulted in, in some ideas and agreements that then got spun out of the organization uh, and did become binding undertakings in other contexts. Um, ideas that very much grew up in the halls of APEC doesn't have halls, but corridors or whatever, and on the margins of these meetings, and then became uh, binding agreements uh, elsewhere. The information technology agreement, which is the one that allows us to all not pay tariffs on uh, most electronics I items um, and until the Trump administration, uh, uh, was reached in, in started in APEC, and then grew and became a global thing. That the the, the uh, environmental Goods and Services Agreement similarly became a WTO beast. And most, perhaps most significantly, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that many of you have, I'm sure have heard of uh, started in APEC um, and ultimately encompassed 12 of its members uh, until one quit and it became 11, the one being the one that started it all, the United States. Um, the most schizophrenic, if we will, uh, economic power on the planet, as well as being the largest. Um, we can get into that later. So that's that's my uh, addition to the concept of what APEC um, is and, and does. The If you think about 2011, and we can get into the, the San Francisco specific aspects, I think, in discussion. Um, so I'll set that aside for now. If you think about 2011, when I was um, looking after things and 2023, there are some significant differences um, in the context of the meeting. Um, first, and perhaps most important, the US is uh, schizophrenic at best on uh, trade and investment policy, looking at the region. Um, walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership is taking primarily a um, a defensive approach towards uh, towards economic uh, trade and investment issues in the, in the current context, uh, and feels very different. And the consensus around are we all actually year by year moving towards regional economic integration, and is that a good thing? Has has uh, is significantly weaker than it was. It depends country by country. Many of the countries of APEC still are very focused on regional economic integration. That's like globalization on a regional basis. Um, but, but some of the economies, much less so. Uh, and some of them have always been speaking with forked tongues, um, mainly the, the PRC, um, proposing the, pushing the idea of economic integration, but then not integrating itself significantly in terms of opening its markets. The, um, but that, that's on the economic side. Geopolitically, it's a fraught environment now. Uh, the US and China are at loggerheads on most every issue. Um, a, the situation is frothy enough in Washington that the, a, the appearance of a large plastic 
um, white object over the state of Montana resulted in a national panic and the dispatching of, of, of a million dollar missile in order to shoot down this, this poor item. Um, the uh, things are frothy in US uh, China relations, but even worse in issues surrounding Russia. And Russia, for better or worse, is, a, is an APEC member, uh, which creates a, no a number of political mousetraps that could spring on the United States as the, as the host and chair. Um, this makes it the job that my successor has significantly more difficult than I had in 2011, to be honest. Um, and then there's a whole question about whether the US is really engaged in the APEC endeavor uh, and how much high level attention it's getting, um, how much energy it's being put into the agenda. I think that's to be determined, but I think it's a question mark. It's not a, a given that, um, that, that the Congress, that the White House, um, et cetera, will put a lot of effort into it. Um, you all could <clears throat> be part of that, answering that, that question, I think. Some similarities, though, from 2011, sorry, Larry, I'm going on too long, um, is that the uh, Asia, defined as everybody but the United States, in this case, including Canada, Peru, uh, Chile, and Mexico, we'll just call them Asian countries for the, for the sake of argument, um, they want the US private sector to be engaged, to be investing, to be trading with them uh, very, very much. And they see their APEC as an opportunity to reinforce the engagement of the US private sector uh, in the region. And, and Monica is going to talk more, I believe, about the, how that plays out in the context of, of the actual APEC events. Um, APEC continues to be a, a much more flexible mechanism than most other international uh, arrangements, uh, meaning that creative uh, ideas coming from a host city, for example, have, have a, uh, a possibility of, being, of, of seeing the light of day. So um, that's important to, to keep in mind. Uh, that there are a lot of APEC gets written on the fly in terms of how it's, how it's organized, what the events are, what the themes are. And so um, just because you're not hearing it from the, from the White House doesn't mean that, that it's impossible to have that be a theme uh, of, of discussion uh, within APEC. And then finally, the, 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 the core messages of APEC are still very compelling. Um, you know, regional connectivity, um, social inclusion, figuring out a way to make globalization work for all members of economies, uh, the greening of the economies of the region, all these are just deeply held um, desires of the populations, governments, and businesses of, of, uh, of the Asia Pacific. And so the, the fundamental rationale for, for APEC activities is, is still extraordinarily strong. So let me give that as sort of the challenges and opportunities for 2023. Great, thanks, Gary, that's fantastic. Um, which is a good, good segue uh, to Monica Whaley. So Monica has been, um, she's the president of the National Center for APEC, it's uh, based in Seattle, and she's been there ever since shortly after her birth um, for many, many years. Uh, she, she is, she called Sandy her, her patron saint. She is our patron saint uh, for, for people who have worked on on APEC all these years, and uh, it's just done a, a wonderful job. Uh, so, Monica, can you tell us about uh, ABAC, how it's structured, and what it's doing, and, and the, the challenges that the that business faces in APEC? Sure. Do I get 30 seconds to correct everything that's gone before me? No. Sure. <laughs> well, you'll, it'll take more than 30 seconds is the problem. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, um, a couple of things. First of all, thank you. Thank the Asia Society. Um, if you ever get a chance to get Matt Murray in here, and he'll be coming to San Francisco a lot, He's a guy you want to get on this stage. Um, he's terrific and really um, knows this stuff inside and out. was a great choice to succeed both of these two as the APEC senior official. So I strongly recommend you do that. Um, secondly, the, the bomber jackets in Seattle were purely practical. It was November. It was Seattle. And they were on a boat going out to an island. <laughs> and, and no, it was not my idea. I think it was Eddie Bauer's idea. But anyway, they, they, somehow they needed to have some sort of covering. Um, anyways, that's, um, 
that's true. So uh, I also want to start to say there are um, so many officials in this room, and I'm delighted to see you here. We've been seeing them in our offices in Seattle. I know that everybody's very hungry for information, and I just want to be sure that I say that all of your official information will come from the State Department or the White House, and I want to be sure that th what I share here, I, I know because I've heard it from, from them, but things are changing fast. And, and San Francisco was only selected, as you all know, in November. We've had a little longer runway on some of these things like Detroit and Seattle and, and Palm Springs, which was where I just came from for the first senior officials meeting. Um, so there's these things are changing fast. So this is why things we don't even know for sure for positive exact dates yet. We've got a week, you know, so that's, um, forgive me if there are not more details that I would like to share because I know you want them, um, but we, we don't have them. And Jack, I will never remember that evening that we sort of shared with thousands of other people in Malaysia that will stick in our, in APEC lore and APEC history forever um, as a, a very interesting gala dinner for the APEC CEO summit that in, in, uh, in Malaysia. Um, Story can be told later to anybody who wants to hear it. But, um, <laughs> and so just to give you an idea that what just happened in Palm Springs was the first set of these senior officials meetings, and I think of them like the executive committee. I'm, I'm a, run a nonprofit organization, so it's like the executive committee of the of APEC. They meet quarterly. They and all of this little subcommittees channel up into them, and they try to manage the flow of what happens. Um, but as an example, for the two and a half weeks they were just in Palm Springs, there were more than a hundred of those subcommittee meetings feeding into the day and a half of time when the uh, National Economic Com Council's Mike Pyle, who is the chair of the senior officials, uh, was on the ground to chair the senior officials meeting. So the, into their two days go a hundred days or a hundred meetings worth of information. Um, I think Detroit is two and a half weeks long. Also, Seattle's is a whole month of meetings. And De Detroit also includes two ministerial meetings, and Seattle includes six. We'll go through more of that later, but just to give you a sense, this is a, a ton of information that gets channeled. What you've got coming in San Francisco is the biggest of them all, so there's it's just a lot to absorb, and I just want to be sure that the, the, you get the proper information before anybody takes action on, on anything said here today, because we want to we want to be sure you have what you what you have. So, um, as as Jack captured the um, APEC Business Advisory Council's birth, it, it actually there's there's some time before that. So we had the alphabet soup, as I think Jack coined the the term for it, because there was. Uh, always PBEC, the Pacific Basin Economic Council that, that Jack did, and there was always the sort of academic side, which was the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council that always called for um, called for the establishment of APEC itself way back in the day, but and, and but wanted to have um, sort of recognize that there should be some sort of thought about the private sector. It didn't quite go for it as as big as PBEC did. Um, there was also something called the Pacific Business Forum that was calling for things, an eminent persons group. I mean, they had all kinds of things, but everybody seemed to agree there there should be, that the that APEC wanted private sector input. And it was unusual that they decided to make it a, an institutional part of APEC. It's, it's actually a seat at the table, and that is still not equaled in any other global entity uh, out there. So the APEC Business Advisory Council is uh, a group of executives. There are three of them from each of the 21 APEC economies. They are named by their leaders, or presidents, prime ministers, et cetera, from each of the 21 economies. Each of the economies have different terms for their APEC people. One of their one of their APEC members has been there from the beginning. Others, like the United States, rotate them regularly, um, and some go in and out with their administrations of you know their. Uh, as there have changes of administration. So we have um, the 63 ABAC members, and they then sit on the, um, and their, their chair rotates. So this year's, the United States is the chair. And of the three US ABAC members who are Dominic Ng, he is the chair, uh, Ginger Liu, and Laura Lane of UPS. Ginger is with uh, I Squared Capital, and she's the, the newest one, so she's the one whose who's, uh, work I don't know as well. Uh, Laura Lane is with UPS. She's a great advocate for 
supply chain resilience, uh, women's empowerment, all sorts of issues. She's brilliant. Um, and we've known her for many years. Um, and Ginger has been a great spokesperson for inclusion and, and women's empowerment as well, and small businesses. She's just been a real champ on those issues. And Dominic has the whole, the whole set of issues to manage. So um, it's been a great year. They've gotten a great kickoff. They just started their meetings in Auckland. Um, but ABAC meets four times a year also, just before the senior officials meet, so that they can to give their input each time the senior officials meet. And in Auckland, they had a joint meeting with senior officials. Um, so th the other timing piece of APEC is that they'll, they'll do their meetings just before the senior officials, but they also do them just before, or in time to create letters to the ministers that are meeting along the way. So before the trade ministers meet in, June, in uh, May in Detroit, they'll send a letter to trade ministers that give um, the recommendations, and these, those are usually ones that are really carefully, you know, obviously the, the air trade area is one that the businesses are really keyed in on. Um, the uh, transportation ministers are also meeting, uh, Secretary Buttigieg is, is gathering his colleagues, counterparts from around the region in Detroit. Uh, obviously, it's a great place to do transportation ministers, and um, they'll, they'll have all sorts of fun there, but they'll... Um, They'll get that one together and they'll do a transportation minister's letter. And I think that will focus a lot on sustainability. So all of these, the, the themes this year are surrounding sustainability and inclusion with kind of a thread of innovation going through all of them. So that's true no matter whether it's trade ministers, transportation ministers, or the six that are going to be meeting in Seattle, which are, and I wrote them down to be sure I got them all. Uh, uh, SMEs, um, food security, health, women's empowerment, emergency response, and energy. And so those, but they're all going to circle around those three themes. And those kind of evolved naturally out of conversations with the US agencies that are heading each of those issues. So the Department of Energy is going to talk about what is going to happen at the energy minister's meeting. But as they each independently came up with their agendas, those themes kept coming up again. So it was really clear that that and sustainability is really going to be a, a centerpiece. So um, as they get, they finish up in Seattle, then they'll go down to, um, and I'm kind of getting a little bit off track here, but they go down to the finance minister's meeting, which is actually going to meet in conjunction with that final leaders week, which is a little bit of a change. Um, and then there's the joint minister's meeting, which is trade ministers and foreign ministers. Um, from all the APEC economies that will be in San Francisco. And uh, to, good to remember that it will be both um, Janet Yellen and Secretary Blinken and Ambassador Tai that have official ministerials here that week in addition to President Biden. So there's, uh, there's a lot going on there <laughs> this week there. Um, and, you know, so there's th that all feeds into the leaders meeting. And in the middle of all that, the APEC Business Advisory Council, the three members from all the economies, the executives, they have their meeting. And when they're finished up, we begin the APEC CEO Summit, which is another thing on the National Center for APEC's plate this year. We do this on behalf of the private sector host committee. Um, as soon as the US announced it was going to be uh, the chair, we were asked to head up that as we did in 2011. Um, at, for the in Honolulu, we created the CEO summit there, and we were asked to do it again. We said sure, and we were delighted that there were quite a few of the U.S. companies that said we're in. We'll you know support you doing this, even in times of COVID and times of uh, belt tightening. We're really pleased that we've got so much great uh, private sector support. So without which we obviously couldn't couldn't do it. So um, and now we're finally finally they named the host city <laughs> and it's San Francisco. So we came right down and looking forward to meeting with the city counterparts. And well, I'm here this week and looking at all the all the facilities and finding out what's going on and finding out how we can work together to make sure because one of the biggest things that's important to me about APEC is you want to feel like you've been where you've been. You don't want to feel like you've been inside a hotel ballroom for a week, because you know, it's, you've got to feel like you, you know, you visited there, you, you've tasted the food, you've met the people. Um, it was great, in, in Palm Springs, one of the APEC members, or APEC members from, I think it was from Korea, commented on how great and friendly his Uber drivers were, um, you know, and I thought that was just great. That's what you want to hear, that, that people are getting a chance to really feel that they've made a visit, so, sorry.
Great, thanks, Monica. Just so, so just to review, in, in San Francisco, the week of November 12th, probably, um, <laughs> I can say that because I don't have any official responsibility, um, you'll have basically five big meetings. So you'll have the finance ministers meet, then you'll have the foreign and trade ministers meet together for the joint meeting. You have the ABAC, the 63 business people meet. Then you have the CEO summit, which is roughly how many people? A thousand, roughly a thousand people. Uh, for the CEO summit, uh, and then you have the, the leaders, right? Those, those, are, those are the five big shows. And then just keep in mind, in addition, to, of course, to, to Secretary Blinken and, uh, and Catherine Tai and, um, and Secretary Yellen, you'll have the finance and trade and foreign ministers of 20, 20 other countries uh, and economies uh, coming, to, uh, coming to town. So it's, uh, it's a lot of folks. Uh, one thing is probably worth mentioning, because uh, there may be questions about Taiwan and, and uh, well, I won't go into Hong Kong so much, but t Taiwan and Hong Kong um, have to be represented. It's actually that, that rule about non-government applies to Hong Kong as well, right? It can't be, oh, it doesn't apply. It can be government from there? It's always been government. It's always been government. So Taiwan is the one that's special. So Taiwan cannot be represented at the leader level by a government representative. So it has to be, a, it'd be a, would have to be a private sector person coming in, so it always is. It, usually is Morris. Uh, Morris uh, yeah. Uh, but just so that, that's, uh, that, just to put that to rest. Um, let, me, let me ask, let's get into just maybe a couple of the, the, the topics that might come up uh, this year that are gonna be on the kind of, the top of the agenda, at least for the United States. Um, Monica has already mentioned the, the three themes. Uh, they're also, they also present them as the three eyes, uh, the three adjectives, which are um, in, uh, interconnected innovative and inclusive. Uh, but under that, that kind of three eyes, Kurt, maybe I can ask you, following it as a consultant now, not as a government person from the inside, um, you know, what are, what are some of the big issues uh, that the U.S. is looking at this year in, in APEC? What, what do you think they hope to get out of this year? So, actually, maybe you can address also, why did President Biden offer to host this meeting? Uh, other than to make Monica's life a, hell, a living hell. Besides that, uh, <laughs> The, um, well, I'll tell you why I advocated that the U.S. do it. Yeah. I don't know, I, didn't, I haven't had a chance to ask the president why he said, this is good. I, he said yes when it was proposed by his staff. But it, it's an opportunity for the U.S., as I said earlier, to really demonstrate commitment um, to the region. And I think in the context of having, having left TPP, um, but also in the context of uh, feeling that the the geopolitical landscape in Asia is changing rapidly and that the, the um, Pacific continues to be extraordinarily important to U.S. economic future. All those things combined led the president to say, yes, let's do this. Um, and in terms of the themes, um, I, I expect to see continuity from previous year's agendas and particularly in the area of uh, of uh, greener economies. Um, the, the Thai uh, chair and uh, Thailand was the chair this past year and they did quite a lot of work in that area and it was significant and there's some follow up to do on that. I think the, the one of the, of the three eyes that you mentioned, the one that is particularly unique is inclusive. And I sense the White House and the planners struggling to figure out a way, how can we rebuild consensus around the idea that trade and investment across borders is, is, is good for economies when that consensus is broken down in the US, in US politics and, and do sort of a bank shot uh, into the, the minds of the American people by reminding them of the importance of the, of the Indo-Pacific region, how many jobs are created through um, trade investment uh, with Asia. Um, it's difficult, to, it's gonna be interesting how they do that um, because there are, uh, uh, there's some skepticism in the administration with respect to the role of business these days uh, and, there's, and there's a lot of skepticism about the role of China in the global economy, which are counter trends against that, that idea that that trade and investment is, is, is good for the economy. But I think that, that the U.S. will be trying to figure out a way to imprint the idea that 
the goal of inclusive growth, meaning growth that includes um, disadvantaged segments of the population, um, and uh, trade and investment liberalization is not inconsistent. So I realize that's a very that's a very grand concept, but it's like this is a really important one, and so I would expect that to be a a, a major theme for the year, and 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 would expect to see the president um, give an address to that effect, whether either at APEC or, or prior to that, which could be sort of his, in, in a way, given the 2024 presidential campaign, his seminal statement about the international economy. Having agreed to host the thing, now he's got to say something about it. Um, this was the trap that many of us were setting for him. So um, it's, a, it's an important opportunity for the president to, to, um, to, to speak out on these matters. The CEO Summit, by the way, one thing that Monica didn't mention, I'm going to steal one of your lines, is it provides an opportunity for many of the leaders to make formal comments in front of a, a meaningful audience. Um, I assume that you'll be doing that again this year, and, and many of them take advantage of that, which is one of the reasons why businesses are attracted to the CEO summit because it gives them a chance to interface with, with, uh, with leaders from around the region. Thanks, Monica. So, from from business point of view, what what are I, I know this is hard because I'm asking you to pick among your children, and um, because I know you have so many different sectors. But if you had to pick two or three major issues that that, that business hopes to be, see addressed this year, what would they be? Well, it's interesting because the one or two that are cutting across all of them are um, digital, which obviously is all my children. Um, and there's a lot of agreement in APEC on that. And so that's one place where I think they can say this enables inclusion, this enables sustainability. We can we can flow it into a lot of the healthcare work that APEC is doing. We can um, we can reach a lot of people in, in inclusivity with that. I mean, COVID taught us a lot of lessons, um, good and bad, and I think that was one. The other is the um, the sustainability piece. Every single company we talk to has sustainability at the top of their list. You go to almost anyone's website, and on the front page, you're going to see sustainability. Even if they you think they're the company that has the, the record of being as <laughs> having dirty shoes or whatever you want to say, um, they will have sustainability on the very front of their website. Some are probably more, um, have more going on in that area than others, but it's surprising how many have a lot, a lot going on. And they're doing really good work and they are anxious to show it off. Um, so I think when we talk about the CEO Summit, I know that one of the things we are thinking about is how do we have those have those threads, the inclusiveness thread for sure, and the sustainability thread with innovation and technology sort of demonstrated throughout all of the paths of, of discussions, um, demonstrations, um, you know, that we want to really try to make it experiential um, because we can do so much now with, with the digital technology and, and all that we can do, we can really make them feel these issues and, and feel the solutions. And we can invite people from the other APEC economies to come show us what they've got. What have, you know, what are they doing in, you know, in uh, inclusivity and in, in sustainability in green technology and all these things. This is the other interesting thing about APEC that it five. No, let's say 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we couldn't mention climate change. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to talk about women or gender, or anything about it. It was just verboten. And you couldn't mention the word corruption. It was like, oh, dear, we can't say that word. You might offend somebody. And then now that's all part of the APEC agenda. It's right on, right up front, right in the middle of the agenda. So it, it's a little like water on a rock, but after a while you keep saying it, you keep doing it, keep pushing it, and things happen. So it, it's not a speedy machine, but it, but it works in the long haul. Let me ask a, a question of both of you, and that is a, a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of folks here are very interested in how they can be involved in the in the leaders meeting and and the, the various events that go on around it, and in your um, in your previous um, uh, um, participation and, and uh, involvement in particularly the one that in uh, in 2011, which the last time the U.S. did it, but in others as well. I mean, what what are the some of the opportunities that you, that you all have seen for 
um, for, for example, companies to do demonstrations maybe separate from or kind of in parallel to what are, what are the, the, the volunteer opportunities for maybe you know, students at universities? Um, what are the opportunities to host visiting ministers and, and leaders from other countries and other economies? Um, what, uh, you know, how, how should folks in this room be looking at those opportunities? Let me start yeah. with Kurt. Right, you want to start? Why, Monica, why don't you start? And then we'll go. Um, I would say there, there should be plenty. There's, there's so much work to do. We can use all the hands we can, we can have. Um, <clears throat> is, is Marone still here? Is she, or should she have to, to take off? Um, the, the city is, is actively putting together some, um, some hosting activities. If any of the companies in, in the room want to talk about that, they're not out yet, but they're building them. And I'd say for those people that want to be part of what um, San Francisco is doing to put its best foot forward, um, absolutely, uh, Marone will be out with some things to do with the city. We're doing the, the CO Summit piece, so those companies that are thinking about you know, a larger scale sort of marketing their products in, in the Asia Pacific writ large and having that kind of a platform to work with. We're doing that. We're seeking a way if, if going through these properties tomorrow, I can figure out a way with my executive producer to say that this showcase idea can happen. We're going to figure out a way to make it open to people that want to just come and do you know, put out the, the showcase, they'll be a part of that exhibit, and, you know, maybe students, maybe maybe uh, labs and, and faculty around here that, that can do something in this gargantuan space that we think we have. Um, and then, you know, or do you do it with an exhibitor plus a ticket to the CEO Summit? I, we don't know all those things. All those things are taking shape. But along the lines with what Kurt was saying before, this administration is committed to making this an inclusive event and trying to make it accessible to a lot of people. And we're committed to doing that too. And we're trying to reach into populations that have not traditionally been involved in a lot of this. And we were able to do that in Honolulu and able to do it in, in at the first informal senior officials meeting was in December. And then we did it in Palm Springs. We had a big reception at Sunnylands and had a bunch of people there that the senior officials got to meet that would never have been to a senior officials meeting in any other circumstance. So um, we're, we're the water against the rock. So we're trying. And so by San Francisco, there should be a good a good divot here, <laughs> worn away. Add to that, Curtis. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, there are so about ten thousand people will come to town for um, for the APEC meetings. Uh, government, journalists, uh, and business people. Maybe, maybe more. Maybe twenty thousand. I don't know. Something like that. A lot. Um, so that creates a, a lot of. Uh, targets of opportunity for engagement by non-official actors uh, to invite a leader, a minister, a business leader to um, participate in an activity, take a field trip, um, do an activity that makes some kind of, has some message associated with it. There are different angles for that. Um, I would expect a lot of the Silicon Valley companies to be reaching out to the, to the visiting leaders and ministers, and a lot of the visiting leaders and ministers saying yes to opportunities to cavort with, um, with the, the excellent companies of the, of, the, of the Bay Area. I would expect to see some of the diaspora communities, of which there are many in the Bay Area, to be um, reaching out to their um, kinsmen, however many generations removed, uh, to uh, talk about some some of their issues uh, in in some in some form or another, um, the uh, universities could be involved. There's also a, the the city at some point will discover that it needs a lot of volunteers, uh, and universities or other organizations could provide many volunteers to help people avoid getting lost. Or, 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 or arrange things like that. So there are a lot of opportunities. It's kind of like the Olympics on a smaller scale where um, many side events can be generated. I have, I have one suggestion. The, the, uh, um, there's a, there was a thing called San Francisco Declaration that Hillary Clinton negotiated here in San Francisco in 2011, which was a, a bold statement of all the economies saying 
that women's involvement in the economy not only is the right thing, but it's the smart thing for um, faster growth. Now, that's been imp implemented to varying extents in different economies and, and the like, but I, I personally hope someone organizes a how are, how's everybody doing 12 years after that declaration kind of, uh, of session. Um, be kind of interesting to see. And then, Larry, we need to talk about advice for the city itself um, at some point. Do you want to do that now? Uh, sh sure. I, I'm, I'm only concerned that we don't have much time for Q&A. Let me, let me, let me do it. Let me do it in one minute, then. Um, the, I mentioned media. Uh, the media come here, and they go to APEC year after year, and they're frustrated because they're not included in the leaders' meeting. They're not really included in the CEO summit. They're not really included in anything. And they need a little bit, yeah. They, they get to sit in the back and take notes at speeches. But they're, they're looking for stories that are interesting. This is a huge opportunity for the city to have its own media center, um, drawing the, the, the frustrated journalists away from writing yet another story about whether, you know, um, Xi Jinping and, and, and Biden you, you know, shook hands with a pinky finger or two fingers or a high-five or whatever, um, and instead write about what a great place San Francisco is. And, but that requires preparation and, 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 and messaging and, and reaching out and doing it. The other question that we haven't mentioned yet is um, political demonstrations and the like. San Francisco is a very uh, a city of free speech, <laughs> shall we say, and so I would expect there to be a lot of that, given the the current geopolitics uh, of the planet. So having a a, uh, a free space pre-established for people to be uh, allowed to go and express themselves and get journalists' attention doing so, because that's that's their ultimate objective, um, that is in a non-disruptive fashion, I think would be a really good idea. That's fantastic advice. Feed them. And the feed, U.S. Feed, government feed, can't feed them. Feed the journalists. Get great California food. And no, no, feed, well, you can do demonstrators too if you'd like, but the media, they can't feed the media, so they have no food, drink, water. You have a little concession for them. Let them, you know, give, give them some food. Let me open up the questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, there, there's a mic coming. Could you identify yourself as, also before you ask a question? And uh, David Kaufman from uh, law firm Nixon Peabody. I'm really delighted. We're, really, we're very excited here in San Francisco to have APEC coming. Um, and uh, I think we have the media shine a spotlight on the great things that are happening here and not some of the articles you're seeing. Um, but I have a question for Kurt. You mentioned that uh, there's an opportunity for us to, to kind of change the script and do things different. Um, what can we do here in San Francisco, aside from you know, those two excellent tactical um, suggestions, to, to do things different for this APEC? And what can we do to make it even more special and showcase what's great about San Francisco? I think that, that some uh, storyline that emphasizes uh, the Bay Area's historical capacity and role in, in, in bridging the Pacific um, that then has a, a specific um, angle to it. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the women in the economy as, as one, but they're just something that, that tells a story about how, um, you know, maybe the immigrant story, the fact that San Francisco was the, is, is, has been historically the num top portal for uh, immigration to the United States from across the Pacific. And then how did that shape the region? Um, why was that good for the region? Why was that good for the economy? Um, would be something to, to, I don't know, make a film about or, or hold a, a conference about or, or have a, 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 a teach-in um, that would encourage other economies perhaps to be open to, to um, migration along the same philosophy as the United States. Hi, I'm Lori Goldman. Um, you had mentioned uh, the three pillars as government, academia, and um, business. And there were some, th and also the themes of inclusiveness and sustainability. And there were some threads in there about NGOs, but I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit specifically about what, what the role for NGOs might be during this, and noting that 
NGOs have been more and more participating in some of the other kind of global meetings, the COP meetings and things like that. So. It, there isn't, I mean, it's, um, as far as the structure of APEC, it, there isn't a, um, like a, an APEC Business Advisory Council that's part of the structure, but we have seen more and more sort of participation around uh, in the CO Summit and things like that um, with with various leaders of NGOs, just based on the topics, you know, we, you know, get sustainability, you get women in the economy, you get different folks who are talking about um, equality and equity and fairness, um, and so we get more people involved in the conversation, and I think that's part of our goal this year, but we haven't seen a particular event or anything drawn up for that, so not yet. Bye. Hi, I, I'm Chuck, Chuck Ng. I'm uh, Asia 21, Asia Society Asia 21 fellow. Um, my question is actually, Monica and, and Kurt, you guys mentioned about, you know, over the years, things have changed, including difficult topics and issues such as corruption. And, and I think given sort of like the geopolitics, if you will, I mean, the two governments, right, for instance, right, there are a lot of these, you know, just, just a word, you know, exchanging of words and tensions and whatnot. But from a private sector, I mean, obviously, I think many people here are really, you know, they're very interested in the cultural people-to-people -people exchanges and whatnot, right? And certainly between U.S. and China and people as such. And do you have any recommendations about things, concrete things that, you know, perhaps whether it's university or other leaders, business leaders can do in terms of sort of some of those exchanges to kind of dial down those tension, if you will? <clears throat> I noticed a huge difference just being able to get together in person. I mean, that's, that, that's the thing I think COVID made so much worse. You just can't do on Zoom what you can do over a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. And that's, uh, I think, unavoidable. It, it was a, a real, did real harm, um, I think, to a lot of relationships. So I think even though there's tensions between governments, I mean, the, govern, the APEC Business Advisory Council gets together. These are all business people, and they sit around, and they'll talk. I mean, the, they all know what their governments say and do, but they'll talk about these issues very freely with each other. And um, you know, they know what the tensions are, but they don't necessarily take, carry them with them themselves. So I think keeping the dialogue going is the key thing. The, the um, uh, people sometimes make fun of APEC saying it's four adjectives in search of a noun. Um, uh, but the noun is actually, is cooperation, right? And then everyone's very frustrated with that because like I've written a thousand memos where I wrote APEC and then forum with a small f because no, like what, what's a cooperation? Are you, are you going to go to a cooperation? Um, you know, you're going to go to a forum. But the the point is that putting the C back in APEC uh, is something that needs to be constantly done. And as an organization, it is naturally inclined towards positive sum philosophies and outcomes in in a way that other international structures are not necessarily. Um, that is of enormous value in the context of what you were raising. Um, as, as Monica said, having leaders get together, having ministers get together, and actually see themselves as both human beings uh, and, and, and talk through issues is enormously important. I'm afraid we're out of time, but one last question here, please. Thank you so much. My name is Carla Mays. My business is Mays Civic Innovation and Smart Cohort. We work on equitable, smart, and disaster resilient cities. And I want to welcome APAC to District 6, um, where my business and I live. And, but we're very worried um, in District 6 if we can be able to host this effectively. We've lost a lot of jobs, businesses, and we have a lot of crime. And I want to understand we want to welcome you properly and what is being done to work with Mayor Breed, um, uh, Supervisor Dorsey, and others so that we can make sure that we can welcome our guests here um, safely and be able to host you in the way San Francisco has always hosted fabulous food, fabulous places to be. Um, and so this is my concern um, in welcoming this event. Great last question. <laughs> well, I was just saying that, that Seattle is concerned about exactly the same thing because we're suffering a lot of the same issues um, in our downtown, especially in ours is going to be held right downtown, uh, the, the third city officials meeting set of meetings. Um, and I think that they're already thinking about it. And I think, that, like I said, the, 
the host committee that the city is going to put together is going to be focusing on the city putting its best foot forward. And I think that takes the community just coming together and deciding this is what we've got to do. This is the San Francisco, the jewel of the Pacific. And, right. you know, by God, let's get out there and, and shine it up and, and make it happen. I would say that, that um, two things. One, federal resources are available for this. So the city doesn't have to do everything in the city looking at Mark again, um, should not be shy in asking the federal government for the support that it that it needs. And then in doing so, not allow, um, and again, you know, I'm, I love being in the private sector, so I can just say this, not, not, not allow the federal government just to focus on security and the assistance that they give, but also think about, about how it uh, could reinforce um, some of the other missions that the city has for its population. I apologize uh, for, for running over, but I think that was a great uh, discussion. Margaret, can I turn it over to you, please? Yes, well, let's give them all a big round of applause. Thank you all. We have a lot to learn and a lot to do, and I know everyone in the community here is ready to welcome APEC to San Francisco, so let us know how we can help with the three eyes. We have a number of events coming up here at Asia Society. As a thank you to those in the room, you'll be receiving complimentary passes to not all of them, but a few of them. Uh, Mike Chinoy, an oral history of American journalists in China, that's on March 13th, right here in this room. We're going to do our Four Consuls General series, talking about security and the path to peace. We have Consuls General from Japan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Thank you to the Japan Consulate for your support on that one. We're going to have a cultural reception, too. You're not going to want to miss that one. And our 25th anniversary gala is going to be held at City Hall on April 19th. Early bird tickets are on sale, and that deadline is tonight, so be sure to get your tickets. <laughs> Thank you to our team who works hard for every single program. Natalie Despiglier, Mackenzie Jacobic, Nina Udagawa, and Aaron Moroccan. All of our volunteers and interns, and good night. Thank you.